I was telling you that hyponatremia is the most commonly tested topic in NCLEX of sodium alteration. The reason for that is because it's very frequent. It's frequent because it's related with diuretics. So all the diuretics may decline, lose sodium, and is at risk of developing hyponatremia. The difference with the other causes is in diuretics, it is a loss of the sodium in the toilet. But together with the sodium, it's lost, um, it's lost water. Just a moment, um, something. Uh, Joan, este, eh, todo el mundo habrá entendido que nos mudamos para el link del lunes. Sí, sí, ya. Todo está ¿Todo aquí. el mundo entendió? Sí. Ok. Ok. Sí, gracias, gracias. Me estaba preocupado por eso. Um, ok, so uh, it is what diuretics do. But the other reason is not loss of sodium. Is that we dilute the sodium when we force or incorporate in the body, in the blood of the person uh, via IV with hypotonic solutions like dextrose solutions are, are water with water or through irrigations and lavages that introduce tap water or hypotonic solutions that can be absorbed by the, by the mucosa of the individual and can reach the blood diluting the sodium. And this is, those are frequent complications. And what the English is asking you is one, nurse, do you know that when you give uh, multiple enemas, gastric lavage, etc., you can have hyponatremia, and then you are going to observe alteration of the level of consciousness or mental status of the client? This is one of the questions. Uh, of course, this is not the way that is tested. But if you understand my explanation, when you see the scenario, you see the, the question, uh, you get you get the right answer. And the other question related with this is, nurse, which one is better to do a massive gastric lavage? Tap water, uh, sterile water, or normal saline? Okay, so you say normal saline, even if it it is not sterile, regular, non-sterile uh, normal saline. Why? Because for the gastric lavage, you don't need to use anything sterile. You don't drink and eat sterile food and liquids because you have normal flora in the intestine. So normal saline is better. Why is better? Because you avoid using water, pure water, tap water, or hypotonic fluid, and you avoid the disbalance that implies the absorption of pure water. So those topics are frequently tested. The only the other disease that produces uh, hyponatremia is the SIADH or too much antidiuretic hormone. The reason is that the patient is not peeing, is not eliminating the water that should be peeing. And for that reason, retains this water and develops water intoxication. Uh, but this is a rare condition, you know. But you know. Anchors also make question of rare conditions. You should remember that this SIADH is more common in clients with cancer, but has many, many, many reasons. The microphone, mute your microphone. Um, if, if, if you want to speak, speak. Otherwise, mute the microphone. Mute your microphone. Okay. And, um, the other topic that they mentioned is that you need to memorize the value 120 or less as critical because it's going to be present in questions of prioritization. You know, you know that in questions of prioritization, all the clients are sick and need to be uh, cared of. But one of them has priority because he's, he's severely sick. And you need to understand that a person that has a sodium below 120 is critically ill because the brain damage that this brings is very serious. And uh, the other uh, facts that I seen tested about this is what you do. So you need to understand that you need to initiate independently because it's expected to be done on all of them, water restriction. And look for the uh, practical approach they are not going to say, well, the following is going to be indicated in, 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 in hyponatremia. And the answer is water restriction. No, 
what is an adequate intervention in a client that has sodium 119 and remove the water pitcher, the water jug from the room. So this is real life scenarios. It's different from the classical question you have been exposed here in the program, where we go to the technical name, etc. They present the practical approach, the real life approach. The hypernatremia, I told you that it was less frequent because you know people drink water and it's very rare to have somebody with hypernatremia. But the classical case of hypernatremia is the diabetes insipido in which there is a severe deficiency of the antidiuretic hormone and the patient pees so much that is reaching a dehydration with hypernatremia. And uh, this client, this client uh, requires free access to water and um, uh, uh, IV fluids. And when when the moment of IV fluids arrive, they can ask you which kind of IV fluids is convenient in hyponatremia, and you need to answer hypertonic solution, sodium chloride three percent, because are very concentrated, and where where we need is the sodium, not the water. While in clients with hypernatremia, they can ask you which kind of IV fluids could be ordered, and then you 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 you, you understand hypotonic fluids, like for example, half normal saline. And don't forget the diet. Uh, you need to know that in English, you they expect to be to be knowledgeable in diet, in, in nutrition. And you need to be knowledgeable about what has sodium in the diet and what we eat and what has not sodium. In general, remember that I told you that any processed food that you buy already cooked or semi-cooked or semi-processed in the bag, in the can, in the box, etc., cetera, is, uh, is something that has a lot of, of sodium. So this is what I was showing to you when I was explaining that. And I, I made these two questions that are so simple that I'm not going to waste time with it. But I was, when um, the problem uh, was, I don't, I don't check the phone when I'm presenting. I'm sorry, but I got um, traumatized what happened today. Okay, um, no, there is no message. Um, hypokalemia, hypokalemia potassium less than 3.5. Why is it frequent? Well, because a lot of clients take diuretics and the most commonly used diuretics are the, uh, the potassium wasting diuretics. I mean, um, the thiazide, uh, hydrochlorothiazide, or the loop diuretics. You know that. Uh, the other reason for having so frequently the hypokalemia is because the patient, when losing Professor, mute yourself. Here. We can't hear you, Professor. Está muted. Nada, you're you're mute. Mm -mm. Nada, no. Guys, Guys, remember that you have the power of muting me. Do you understand that or you don't understand that? Yes. Okay, everybody needs to understand that I'm giving you the power of being presenter so we can participate freely, record, etc. But you can mute me. So pay attention what we're doing, you know? So take, take care of what you click. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you go to where my name is and there is a microphone there and you click there, you mute me. Don't do that again, please. Okay, let's go back. Oh, Lord. Okay, we were saying, we were saying that any loss of gastrointestinal tract is going to imply the loss 
of potassium. And anything vomits or diarrhea means loss of potassium. So vomit, nasogastric suction, diarrhea, etc., is a loss of potassium. But the other cause of having low potassium is when the patient is receiving glucocorticoids. Do you remember when you study Cushing disease, which is a disease of the hyperfunction of the adrenal gland, in which the client has too much endogenous glucocorticoids? And did you remember that everything was high except the potassium that was low? Yes, the administration of glucocorticoids and patient with Cushing implies hypokalemia, and this is frequently tested in English. Don't forget this detail. The patient that has hypokalemia can die, can die mainly because cardiac arrest. There are other manifestations of the hypokalemia. The muscles are very weak. The reflexes are very depressed. The patient has muscle cramps apart, at, at the same time that it has a muscle uh, weakness. And the peristalsis, the movement of the muscle of the intestine also paralyzes. So a patient that has low potassium has decreased or absent bowel sounds and tend to have constipation. This is tested. They request, they require you to know this detail. A uh, question in English. The patient had surgery two days ago. Bowel sounds have not yet returned. What you need to do first to clarify what is happening? And the answer is check for the electrolytes to see if there is hypokalemia. This is an example. This is an example. The other frequent, frequent topic that is tested in hypokalemia is that if you know the electrocardiographic alterations of the hypokalemia. Remember in the EKG, we have the P wave, Q, R, S, and T. Those are the normal weight, okay. In hypokalemia, an abnormal wave is added after T. And this in alpha order corresponds the name or the, the, yes, the, the letter U. So the presence of a U wave is what is found in hypokalemia. In a real EKG is going to be seen like a depression or going down of the ST segment, inversion of the T wave, and appearance of a positive extra wave that is the U wave. So in, in, in an EKG, you are going to have P wave, you are going to have the QRS, and then the ST segment is going to go down. And the T wave, instead of being positive, is going to be negative. But then after the T wave appears, a positive wave that was not present before, which is the EU wave. This is um, the EKG of a client with, um, with U wave because hypokalemia. So uh, how is tested in anklers? Which of the following four EKGs and present four EKGs strips. Which of the following four EKGs is expected in a client receiving high doses of furosemide? So you, you need to connect concept. High doses of furosemide, alterations, EKG. What alteration I know can appear in the EKG of a person Electrolytes alterations, electrolyte alterations can produce a EKG alteration. So I need to think in hypokalemia. What is the alteration that I expect? The appearance of a U wave, a wave that normally is not present in the EKG. And also I'll see the pressure of the ST segment and inversion of the T wave. As you see here, you see the ST segment depressed the T wave becomes negative, inverted, and then appears an abnormal round, okay, positive wave here, which is the EU wave. Is clear? So this is another topic that is important. And then uh, they ask you, and, and what you do? You administer potassium. What do you need to know about the administration of potassium? Well, many questions. First, 
The potassium can be administered in, in food, with food. So they are going to ask you which food is rich in potassium. One of the, of the homeworks that you need to do is to several times make a list or go to Google or whatever and read several times until state the idea in your brain of which food is high in potassium and which food is low in potassium because both are tested. Please, when you do that, also look for food high in sodium and low in sodium. And also, please review food high in calcium, don't care low in calcium, high in calcium and food high in iron. Don't care about low iron, high iron. So I repeat, you need as a homework for your anchor to review. Don't memorize, just read several times. Oh, mira. And when you see something that you don't know because it's not in your culture or in your language, these, uh, these vegetables, etc., please Google that investigate that if you don't believe me okay no problem don't believe me but i can assure you that you need a lot of culture and knowledge about food in english american food to be able to have a comfortable passing grade in english so the food that a client is convenient if the potassium is low is food rich in potassium of course and then you are going to recommend fruit not all the fruits the Mainly fruits are tropical fruits, yes? You are recommending vegetables, but not all the vegetables. Vegetables that are green, green, dark green are the best that are rich in potassium. And uh, uh, of course, doctor will order a potassium supplement. The potassium supplement has a problem that is tested recently. Somebody told me that I had this question recently in English. Potassium supplements, either in tablets or in liquid, tends to burn, burn the esophagus, produce esophagitis, heartburn. For that reason, the, the liquid forms need to be given very diluted in juices, in, in, in fruit juices, preferably, of course, orange juice that is so rich in potassium. But the tablet is enteric coated. Enteric coated tablets from pharmacology are tablets that are covered by a layer that is not dissolved until it reaches the intestine. And this way protects the esophagus and the stomach of, uh, of the contact with the potassium that is irritant to those tissues. And the question was, do you crush the tablet of potassium? No, you cannot crush the tablet of potassium because it's enteric coated and the enteric coated okay, tablet like ecotrine aspirin, enteric coated aspirin, ecotrine, or um, potassium is cannot be crushed because then you, you destroy the purpose of having that. Okay, the IB potassium has an important risk. So it's very delicate. It's your responsibility to understand that a patient can be killed injecting potassium in the vein. And you know, as a matter of fact, criminals are killed. The death penalty if I be potassium. So now you need to understand that, yes, you are going to have questions asking you if you are aware how delicate is given potassium IB. Like, for example, a patient receiving IB potassium without, pro without any problem, at the adequate dose with the pump perfectly, but need to go to a procedure. What do you do? Then, yeah, what do you do? You stop the potassium. The patient cannot go to a procedure uh, that you are not accompanying the client receiving potassium because you never know which accident, which problem, which modification in the pump can occur out of your supervision, supervision out of your surveillance. Make sense? And it's an example, okay? The other, the other topic that you need to remember, this is the safe speed of administration of potassium below 10 mil equivalent per hour. And this is what I can tell you I see and tested frequently about potassium anchors. Hyper, uh, if you have any question, ask me, okay? No, don't be shy, don't be shy. Don't open your microphone to, 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 to make noise in the kitchen, but if you make a question, stop me, ask me. Hyperkalemia, 
hyperkalemia is seen mainly in renal failure. So the 99% the of clients with hyperkalemia you will see are renal failure. Of course, there are other causes of hyperkalemia. Don't forget this phenomenon that inside the cells, you have a lot of potassium. The 3.5 to 5 is in the blood, not in the cells. But inside the cells, you have 150, more than 150 uh, you know, milliequivalent of potassium. If there is a massive destruction of cells, in an individual, then this intracellular potassium is going to be spilled in the blood and the patient can develop hyperkalemia. And this is the question of a patient that has a burn. In a burn, you have a sudden destruction of a lot of cells. In hemolysis, uh, hemolysis, okay, in hemolysis, a lot of red blood cells are broken and destroyed and release the potassium. And the famous tumor lysis syndrome, a condition in which the day of the chemo in a patient with cancer, the chemo, that the first day of the chemo, will destroy millions of cancer cells. And cancer cells are cells, contain potassium inside. So those are examples where you can have hyperkalemia because massive destruction of cells, okay? The burns, the um, uh, hemolysis, and the tumor lysis syndrome when patients with cancer receive um, um, chemotherapy for first time. And of course, the shift of the intracellular to extracellular is what produces this hyperkalemia. Don't forget there are certain, certain medications that are very good medications, but can have the potential of increasing potassium. But this increment of the potassium with this medication are seen in patients with renal failure. Normal patients taking ACE inhibitors or spironolactone, the potassium sparing diuretic, don't have problem of hyperkalemia. Is is this this is contraindicated the ACE inhibitors and the potassium sparing diuretic if the patient has already a terminal renal failure with increment of the potassium because the renal failure. Or, for example, a patient that they tell you in the ankles has high potassium. The patient has high potassium, and you believe that because you said in the question, can this patient take ACE inhibitor? You need to say no. So how is tested? The, um, the doctor prescribed lisinopril or ramipril to a client, which finding in the in the in the history of the client require that you clarify this order with the doctor and then the answer is the patient has potassium seven okay so you cannot give ACE inhibitor somebody has already potassium in seven or the patient has you know that the manifestation and the ekg of hyperkalemia is a tall high and peaked acute t wave those are been the question in the anchors Connecting concepts. Yes, the EKG manifestation of hyperkalemia is mainly the elevation, the abnormal elevation of the T wave that normally is very round and small, like you see here, no? The normal T wave here is very tall and peaked. This is an early manifestation of hyperkalemia. Later, when the potassium is too high, then it will become the, the widening of the QRS, prolongation of the QT, um, you know, flattening of the P wave, but this is too much. The one that I need to remember is the U wave in hypokalemia and the tall peaked T wave in hyperkalemia. Don't forget the role of the of the salt substitutes in this business. Remember that salt substitutes is, are, is potassium, potassium chloride. And it's no, bad, it's no bad, it's okay. There is no problem with salt substitute. You, you or me can have salt substitute because we have good kidneys. The patient that cannot consume salt substitute is a patient that has a renal disease or a patient that is already having high potassium, or a patient that is taking high doses of ACE inhibitors, you know, because then it's too much. 
Don't forget that the sequence of treatment of hyperkalemia is tested, and the sequence is complicated. The first, the number one to be given is calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate. Why? Because this is going to protect the heart from developing a dysrhythmia. Then, when calcium gluconate is already given in only one dosis, the second step is the, uh, um, the intervention that will lower quickly, I'm saying quick, quickly, the potassium in the blood, and this is with insulin. The sodium polystyrene, also known as K-exalate, is not quick, is, is low, very slow, too slow. The one that quickly lowers the potassium in the blood is the insulin. Insulin has the capacity of moving the potassium from the blood to inside the cells. The potassium inside the cells is not a problem. The potassium is a problem when it's high in the blood. Insulin can shift, can transport the, pot the potassium that is in excess in the blood to inside the cell, and now the concentration of potassium in the blood normalizes. But it happens, meanwhile, the client is receiving a continuous drip of insulin. To avoid the hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, that would induce giving insulin to a patient, you need to administer the insulin together, dextrose. This is clear. But it is a continuous dripping. It's not a definitive solution. If this dripping is stopped, the potassium returns to the blood. So now is when the, the last step is when the sodium polyesterine is administered. No? A sodium polyesterine is administered. And this is administered in the intestine. So it can be administered in enemas, in an enema of sodium polyesterine and retention enema. It means that when the enema is administered, the patient needs to hold and need to keep that inside because this polyesterine needs to stay in the intestine for four to six hours. It's the time necessary to suck, to subtract from the blood toward the intestine, the potassium that is in excess in the blood of the walls of the intestine, in the blood vessel of the walls of the intestine. This sodium poly polystyrene tamin, also can be given orally, but it is lower. That's why I mentioned the enema as the most commonly used in emergencies. After several hours of being this sodium poly poly polystyrene in the intestine, the doctor prescribed or a cleansing enema or a laxative to eliminate that in the toilet so the potassium now go to the toilet. Don't forget that the low potassium diet includes the fruits that grow in cold weathers and certain type of vegetables that are very watery, like lettuce, um, cabbage, um, winter squash. Um, green beans, okay, that are uh, low in potassium. By the way, Edita, green beans has been lately, lately very frequently tested in NCLEX as a vegetable low in potassium. So uh, green beans, um, habichuelas, okay, uh, habichuelas tiernas, habichuelas, yes, green beans, okay, Little, a, a detail, a secret, okay, is a, is a, is a, espionage, okay? So, uh, but you already should know the apple, pear, peaches, berries, grapes, cherries, that are fruits of cold weathers are um, low in potassium. Let's see if you can apply what we learned to any scenario. A client has been treated for hypokalemia, so has low potassium, had low potassium, doctor prescribed potassium supplement, supplements, and the question is, which clinical manifestation or condition indicates that the treatment has been effective? Having a bowel movement daily, gaining two pounds on the last week, EKG showing inverted T wave, fasting blood glucose of one OCs. Who can see? tell me, see, that the patient is improving? Is a sign that improvement? Because oh. they, 
the yeah, questions yeah, say, yeah, which manifestations I, 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 say I the, the trading is effective. C, okay. Okay, so uh, gaining weight, gaining weight is not a manifestation of improvement of the potassium. Uh, changes in the EKG is not a manifestation of improvement. The blood sugar has nothing to do in, it's not, it's not influenced by the potassium. We already explained what is the role of the glucose, but it's not because the, glu the, the potassium, it's because the insulin that is given. So obviously, if we studied and insisted that when there is hypokalemia, there is a decreased peristalsis, and you know that peristalsis is needed to pull, now you know that the patient is improving, is improving, is better of the hypokalemia because the patient is pulling, is having a bowel movement daily. So now you see how this is tested in NCLEX, how you need to apply the concept, how you to connect two cables to make an, a spark and get the idea. So ruling out, okay, discarding, eliminating what has nothing to do, please, in which moment we said that gaining weight is related with potassium? Never. Gaining weight in short period of time is fluid retention and gaining weight in a long period of time is that you are eating too much. EKG, inverted T wave is a manifestation of low potassium. How can be inverted T wave a manifestation of improving of the low potassium? Doesn't make sense. And the blood sugar, but by the way, it's normal, has nothing to do with potassium. We mentioned that the glucose is given because the insulin, the one that lowers the potassium is the insulin, not the dextrose. But you know that you give insulin to a person, you anticipate that the blood sugar of this person is going to drop. And to avoid this hypoglycemia, you give the insulin with dextrose. So you need to make an effort of understanding the details and being able to understand very clearly the concept. Now apply that to a real life scenario. There's a patient that had low potassium, and now they ask of these four findings, what is related with the potassium? Well, if the low potassium producing constipation because it's producing paralysis of the intestine, then if you have normal movement of the part of the intestine, you go to the bathroom every day. That's it. This is NCLEX. This is the way that you are going to have the question in NCLEX. Calcium is also very uh, commonly tested in NCLEX. The most commonly question is hypocalcemia. Why hypocalcemia is the most common? Because low calcium can kill the client. Low calcium can produce cardiac dysrhythmias. Specifically, uh, is going to produce a ventricular tachycardia or VTAC, as you Again. like. It. Or VTAC as this this microphone mute this microphone. Okay. Okay. Uh, ventricular tachycardia to, called torsade point. Okay. And Low calcium can produce seizures, severe seizures. And uh, low calcium can produce spasms in the larynx and obstruction of the airway. So it's serious, it's serious. Low calcium basically is found if the parathyroid glands are damaged. It's practically impossible to see low calcium if the person has, if the person has normal parathyroid glands. The reason for that is that parathyroid glands produce a hormone that can go to the bone where you have a lot of calcium, you have too much calcium in the bones, can go to the bones and can take, can steal calcium from the bone and put it back in the blood. That's why meanwhile, the parathyroid glands are present and working, it's very rare to see hypocalcemia. So what is the conclusion that we have, the most important, cause of hypocalcemia is damage of the parathyroid glands. And the most common cause 
of damage of the parathyroid gland is thyroid surgery. So take care with the game of the words, okay? Thyroid is a gland that we have here and is the one of the hyper and hypothyroidism and produce thyroid hormones. But behind the thyroid gland, you have little teeny glands, four piece-sized glands that are called parathyroids. This is the one that I'm talking about. So when doctors do a surgery in the thyroid, which is a common surgery, but because two more nodules, um, et cetera, they can harm the parathyroid circulation. And for that reason can appear an acute post-surgical hypoparathyroidism, so decreased function of the parathyroids. And this can bring hypocalcemia. And this is the most common scenario in, in testing. It is true, it is true that there are other situations in which you can have hypocalcemia. For example, you should know that the bank blood, what means is bank blood, blood that is in the blood bank, is stored in the blood bank, the blood that has been donated by people and is uh, given to somebody who needs blood, okay? Massive, that means massive, too much, too much, a big volume, massive transfusions. I mean, patients that need to receive eight, 10, 12 bags of blood. What is that? Yes, patients that are coming from an accident are bleeding a lot. Patients that are in, in, in surgery are bleeding a lot and they need to receive in a short period of time, in, in one hour, uh, many bags of blood. Okay, these persons that are receiving massive transfusions can develop hypocalcemia, acute hypocalcemia. You know why? Because the bank blood has no calcium. And when you receive this massive transfusion, because your blood with your calcium is in the floor, it's, it's, you bled and, 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 and you know the blood is on the floor. Yes? Now what you have in your blood, in your veins is what? Bank blood that has no calcium. The reason for that is because the anticoagulant used in, um, in, tran in transfusions in bank blood is a, 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 a anticoagulant that sequestrate or eliminate the calcium from the blood. And the other client that could have hypocalcemia and could be tested is severe, severe acute pancreatitis. Uh, because a process called saponification that occurs in pancreatitis, um, the, 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 the process can steal calcium acutely from the blood and we, you can have a transient acute hypocalcemia. But immediately the parathyroid is going to be activated is going to the bone, scrape the calcium from the bone and put it back in the blood. Okay, so the most common question is hypoparathyroidism. And then what you have there, you have everything exalted, everything up. So you are going to have the muscle too contracted. So you are going to have a spasm, if you know, if sustained contractions in the muscles. And this sustained contraction of the muscle classically produces two signs that you need to recognize, memorize, and understand the shevostek and the trousseau. So you need to see, being able to see a picture like this, in which a splutter is tapping, touching, tapping the face in front of the ear, and the patient develops an involuntary and a non unwill uh, contraction of the side of the face, a twitch of the face. And the trousseau occurs when there is ischemia induced in the arm. And how we induce ischemia in the arm? Very simple. Checking the blood pressure. When you check the blood pressure, you inflate a cough with air that makes pressure, 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 until obliterating, until collapsing, until pushing the artery and blood is not passing. In this moment, when you are taking the blood pressure, then the patient will develop this contraction. The contraction is elbow contracted, wrist contracted, and then you have contraction or flexion. Um, I'm saying contracting, I should say flexion. Flexion of the elbow, flexion of the wrist, flexion of the um, carpophalangeal joint 
but extension of the interphalangeal joint. Okay, so the client's doing this spasm the hand that reminds me mm, flipping the, the bird. Okay, and it's funny. And this is the way that I remember it because it's nothing wrong being funny. Um, and uh, this is the true soul. A way, a way of um, don't, not confusing the two is remember that cheek, cheek is the name of this part of the face. And we see the twitching, the cheek, and you tap on the cheek, and Chevostek is, uh, is written with CH, the same as cheek. And I don't know, blood pressure in Spanish is called tension. <laughs> Take my tension, toma la tension, okay? So, true salt tension, okay? So, don't forget these two signs because are frequently tested. It can be tested with pictures, and then you need to identify the sign. And you need to recognize this as a sign of hypocalcemia. Clients with hypocalcemia are going to have uh, abnormal electrical activity in the nerves. And classically, it's going to produce tingling, like, you know, like ants crawling, tingling and numbness around the lips. It's, it's called circumural, circumural numbness, and in the tip of the fingers and toes. And I remember that this detail is present in the scenario of the client that just had thyroid surgery, and this tingling and the mouth and the tips of the fingers and toes should make you think that the client is developing hypoglycemia. You can verify that exploring the, the chevros stick or the trussel, and then comes the intervention. The intervention is the administration by protocol of the calcium gluconate. Those are the situations in which you need to know in English, they tell you, you don't need to call the doctor if the patient, you, if you know that is accepted, that patient with hypocalcemia with these signs require IV calcium gluconate in the anchors in the test, this has been already prescribed. You don't need to call the doctor. It's already in the standing orders, in the protocol of the management of the hypocalcemia. So don't, don't um, avoid choosing a logical correct option of intervention if you think that you need to call the doctor for this order. Because when we know that is needed, like an EpiPen in a client with anaphylaxis or um, a calcium gluconate in a, cal a client with hypocalcemia, is already ordered, okay? It's already prescribed in the end. They say that to you in their ankle test plan that you can access in their page, but I'm telling that to you. To you. I'm telling this to you. Okay, so uh, calcium gluconate is going to be administered. So how is tested? What medication you need to have available in a patient that has thyroid surgery? And then you are going to have medication that sounds sound like logical, but the most important is based in the concept that we studied that the most common cause of uh, hypoparathyroidism is the thyroid surgery, and this is going to be expressed as an acute hypocalcemia that is risky, then you need to select of the four medications mentioned there, calcium gluconate as the most important to have at the hand just in case the patient develop hypocalcemia. Um, uh, remember, the patient with hypocalcemia can have seizures, so it makes sense that you initiate seizure precaution. And the other topic that is tested, okay, you have a client that for A, B, or C reason, chronic hypoparathyroid doesn't have chronic hypocalcemia. The diet, what diet do you recommend? So now you need to know the food that is rich in calcium. You say, I very easy, milk and dairy. No. They can complicate the question telling you that the patient has lactose intolerance or doesn't like dairy. And then you need to go for the, to the other sources of calcium, like bony fishes, sardines, uh, salmon, tuna, um, green leafy vegetables, broccoli, spinach, uh, tofu, almonds, etc. You need to become knowledgeable in diet because I can promise you, you are going to have a lot of questions about nutrition and diet related with medical conditions, nursing situations in your ankles to you need to 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 educate yourself in in nutrition one question for example that comes to my mind in this moment in ankles is the nurse is doing is exploring the chevostek sign which nerve 
with cranial nerve is exploring the nerves. The nerve that is tapped in front of the ear, in the cheek, to explore the tech is the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve. And this is the answer. This is the answer. Okay. Obviously, it's the nerve that can produce a contraction of the face. Hypercalcemia is less frequently tested, but is tested. Hypercalcemia has one main consequence. The kidneys are acutely damaged if the calcium is too high. Hypercalcemia occurs mainly in cancer. Uh, it's called tumoral hypercalcemia and is considered one of the oncological emergencies. Cancer has, many cancers has the bad habit of giving bone metastasis and it puts a very rapid uh, destruction of parts of the bone. And when the bone is destroyed, as I said before, our bone has a lot of calcium. This calcium is released uh, by the metastasis to the blood. But from the blood is quickly being transferred to the kidneys where it, it is excreted in the earring. So the consequence of the hypercalcemia is the hypercalciuria. And the hypercalciuria is the one that can harm the client because the hypercalciuria produces renal failure, acute renal failure. And the classical question of hypercalcemia is only one. What do you expect doctor to do? Force diuresis, giving too much liquid, IV and oral, and administration of furosemide or loop diuretics that have the property of forcing the excretion of the calcium through the urine. Um, you know there is a hormone called calcitonin that is uh, opposite, op opposes the action of the parathyroid hormone. So move the calcium from the blood back into the bone is used for the treatment of osteoporosis and can be used also for the treatment of an severe acute hypercalcemia. Any question? If you have any question, ask the question. I'm just sharing with you what I've seen about this uh, electrolyte, but if you have doubt or question, ask the question. Magnesium. Magnesium is tested, but magnesium is very easy. You know why? Well, one detail of magnesium, frequently you forget Many students, a lot of people forget the normal value of magnesium and it is needed in NCLEX because they can give you a question with uh, four electrolytes, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and they give you the values of them. And then uh, they can give you the normal values of the other they give a normal value of the uh, other electrolyte, but an abnormal value of one of them. And one of the most frequently seen in my experience is magnesium. I think that, that the people that write the English do that because they know that most of the people know the normal value of the sodium, potassium, and calcium, but forget calcium is very easy, 911, 9 to 11, yeah. But the magnesium is frequently forgotten. 1.5 to 2.5 is the most accepted. Yes, I know that you are saying, oh, but I saw in that book that is a little different. Okay, don't worry. They give you extreme values. Okay, they give you the one hypermagnesium and they give you four. So don't worry if that book is 2.5, that book says 2.8 or 2.6, it's not important. But um, you need to know. Those values are the most accepted and the most catching because 1.5 to 2.5 is catching, it's easy to memorize. Um, how you study low magnesium, very easy, is exactly the same as hypocalcemia. Any sign and symptom and complication related with hypocalcemia is, uh, is uh, repeated, is uh, produced by the hypomagnesemia. So they can produce true soche, was tectors, other points, all the stuff that you know um, really with um, the hypocalcemia. And the intervention then is the giving, giving magnesium to the client as magnesium sulfate. A question in English, is common low magnesium? Is not common. Nevertheless, always magnesium should be tested in any client with cardiac dysrhythmias. And what is the client with, with more, most frequency present with hypomagnesemia? Client with malnutrition. And which is the person? with highest risk of malnutrition in America, alcoholics. 
So remember, alcoholics frequently have malnutrition. And um, malnutrition is associated with hypomagnesemia. Hypermagnesemia. You already know a lot about hypermagnesemia because I'm pretty sure that if you pass the OB class, you learned about preeclampsia and the use of magnesium sulfate for the prevention of seizures in or eclampsia in those clients. And you learned that this magnesium is given in, in IV bolus and infusion, and this could elevate the level of magnesium. So a person that is not receiving IV magnesium should have maximum 2.5 milligrams per deciliter of magnesium. But a person that on purpose is receiving magnesium IV to prevent seizures or as an utero inhibitor, okay, in OV, elevates this level until 7 maximum 7.5 because above 8, 8 or above is toxic. And you should know that if you pass OB, okay? And um, you also know that the risk of reaching toxic level with magnesium in preeclampsia is that the woman will stop breathing and the, the woman and the baby will die. So magnesium is the depressor of the nervous system which in excess can reach the, the, the intensity of producing a respiratory arrest. And also you learn in, 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 in OB that to prevent reaching these toxic levels, the nurse has the responsibility of checking the deep tendon reflexes, DTR, deep tendon reflexes, which is no more than this uh, uh, knee jerk or patellar reflex, every 15, 20 minutes and should um, should be kept at the intensity of two plus. If it is a hyperreflexia or disappearance of the reflex, then the nurse has the obligation of stopping the IV infusion of the magnesium sulfate. And remember that what you use to obtain those reflexes is a hammer, martillo, hammer, is a rubber hammer, is a reflex hammer. Okay. Um, Another cause of hypermagnesemia is renal failure and patients that abuse of milk of magnesium as a laxative. Okay, as interesting comment. A client with chronic renal failure receiving dialysis complains of frequent constipation. So renal failure. What has renal failure? Renal failure has problem with hyperkalemia and has problem with hyper chronic kidney disease, renal failure, magnesemia. So what are the two electrolytes to, to monitor in renal failure? Potassium and magnesium, yeah? So a client with chronic renal failure receiving dialysis complains of frequent constipation. Which, when performing discharge teaching, which over-the-counter product should the nurse instruct the client to avoid at home? If they have problem with magnesium, they should not be taking what? Milk of magnesium because it will increase the magnesium. This is the way that is tested in English. ABGs. What you need to know about ABGs? First, you need to know well your normal values because you need to be working with the values. I'm sorry, they are going to... I'm sorry Professor. Yes, sir. Uh, talking about magnesium, uh, I see you say you mentioned the deep tendon reflex. Uh, I don't see you. I don't know what about the, the urine output. If it's less than okay, if you know that magnesium elevate elevate in renal failure, yes. Also, you can have urinary output as an important component to monitor in hypermenesemia because if the client is not peeing, is in renal failure. You know, so that's why yes. also you need to monitor renal output. I don't know if you remember that a patient with preeclampsia can develop acute renal failure, can be a complication of the, of the preeclampsia, no? And of course, uh, urinary output is important also in patients that are at risk of hypermagnesemia because if there is decreased urinary output, it's because the kidneys are not working properly and then magnesium should not be taken 
in renal failure, like says this question that a patient with renal problems should not take milk or magnesium. Yes, trying to associate the, the, the renal function with magnesium also. Okay, the same happens, if, for example, in hypokalemia, if, if you are you are giving po a, a potassium, you need to be sure that the patient is having normal urinary output. Yes, yes, tell me. Yes. No, I was saying if I'm in the NCLEX and they put uh, the reflex, tendon reflex and the urine output, which one I, I should choose? Okay, NCLEX never, never, the same as Professor Vajin, never make you choose among two right answers. So don't worry about that. NCLEX is not tricky. Anchors make fair questions. Okay, they are going if they are going to ask you about both urinary output and reflex. It's a select of all that applied question. Which of the following parameters you should be monitoring in a client with preeclampsia receiving magnesium sulfate? Select all that apply. Oh, level of consciousness. Yes. Uh, deep tendon reflexes, yes. Urinary output, yes. Blood level of magnesium, yes. Uh, uh, un distractor, uh, distractor um, um, glucose level, no, uh, etc. You know, so uh, so don't think that in ankles you are going to have tricky question in which having the knowledge you are going to be in a predicament of deciding in between two correct answers never will happen. The only possibility is a select of that applied question. Yeah. So if they ask you in English, which of the following need to be monitored in a client with preeclampsia receiving magnesium sulfate, and they say A, uh, deep tendon reflection, B, urinary output, <laughs> you need to answer both. And because you cannot answer both in a multiple choice question, this question will not be in your NCLEX. In the, uh, understood? Maybe. Are you yes, thank it? you. Yes, yes, you understand? Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. ABG, so you need to memorize the normal values, I just said. One detail that I insist a lot, and I don't know if it's still some of you is having problems. Is that the level of carbon dioxide that is this, 35 to 45, will depend on the ventilation. And I need you to understand what is ventilation. Ventilation is the action of sucking air and pushing air out. So inspiration and expiration, breathing in and breathing out is called ventilation. Or uh, any person has a normal ventilation that is regulated by the respiratory center in the brain, the brain stem, um, the muscle of the respiration, the nerves, and the diaphragm, and the integrity of the chest wall. This ventilation and the and the permeability, open openness of the airway. So the patient can suck air and push air out if the respiratory center is okay, if the nerves and muscles that participate in the respiration are okay, if the airway is open, and um, that's it. This is what, what, what participates in ventilation. You need to know that if you have a normal ventilation, then your CO2 will be in this range. Now you need to understand that if for any reason a person hyperventilate is because it's breathing in and out faster and deeper than normal. So uh, a person that is breathing <laughs> fast, I mean tachypnea, uh, and very deep, okay, uh, is a person that is hyperventilating. When a person Professor, hyper... Professor, we can't hear you again. Uh, I, can I, hear him. I can hear him. I can hear him. Okay, so uh, the person who muted me, uh, you know, unmuted me. Okay. No, you have you're, the... not mute, Professor. you're not mute, Professor. Still can't hear you, you're Professor. Okay, so now you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Um, so, as I was saying, when a person is hyperventilating, is throwing away, is uh, wasting. Professor, is a... we yes. can't hear you. 
Well, I can't hear you. Maybe I did something. So um, let me let me clarify. Is only one person the one that cannot hear me, or is everybody? I can hear you. It's okay. I can hear you. I can it's, hear you. Yeah, we can't hear you. Okay, okay so you're the, a good the, professor. You're the, a per, good. The, the person that cannot hear me is probably having a, a you know a problem in the contact with the microphone or something like this. Trying to fix it. Okay, because the rest of the people can hear me. Okay. Um. So I was saying. When the patient is hyperventilating, you expect that the CO2 in the blood being low, and it is very important. A patient that is hypoventilating is a person has problem in the respiratory center. They see morphine, they see too much magnesium sulfate. Let's see increased intracranial pressure with pressure in the in the brain stem, or a person that is having um, a cervical spinal cord injury that is disconnection or the person is having weakness in the muscles of the respiration. Let's talk about Guillain-Barre. Let's talk about um, myasthenia gravis in crisis. Uh, or a person that has an obstruction of the airway, yeah, uh, because of the foreign body, et cetera, laryngospasm, um, edema, et cetera. So those are examples in which the person can hypoventilate. Because uh, why? Because it, it, the elements that we said before participate in the ventilation, respiratory center, muscles, and nerves, and the, the 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 permeability of the airway are important. When you hypoventilate, you cannot throw away, you cannot eliminate the CO2 that you should be eliminating, and then you retain the CO2. Okay. So what defines ventilation is the CO2. And any alteration of the CO2 is going to be dependent, dependent by the ventilation. Um, you need to know that CO2 is acid. When CO2 binds water, becomes an acid, carbonic acid. So CO2 is acid, as acid is vinegar or lemon. And it's a concept that you need to have very clear. It will help you a lot of to understand different situations. So, um, if for any reason you retain CO2, you become acid. But if you eliminate too much CO2, you are eliminating too much acid, and then you become alkaline, becomes alkaline. Because you need to have a balance between the bases or alkaline substances in your body and the acid substances. And CO2 is one of these acid substances. If you hyperventilate and you throw away, you waste too much CO2, then you throw away, you waste your acid. And who is going to win in the balance? Is going to win the alkaline because you don't have enough acid. And vice versa, if you retain CO2, then you gain acid. And then who is going to win the acid? Yes. So hyperventilation tends to produce respiratory alkalosis, and hypoventilation tends to produce respiratory acidosis. The element that represents the alkaline substances is mainly bicarbonate. And bicarbonate is produced by the kidneys. But the kidneys produced by carbonate, by carbonate eliminating acid in the urine and it is a slow process so kidneys can throw in the urine acid hydrogen which is the representative of the acid and produce bicarbonate but it is a slow uh, the problems that are primarily due to co2 are called respiratory problems because it depends on the respiration but the problems that have you know um, relation with the bicarbonate uh, gain or loss uh, and the accumulation of uh, acids different from the CO2 are called metabolic. So it is a basic, a basic, a basic concept, okay? Uh, as I said before, I think that for ANCLEX, for the level of questions in ANCLEX, the acronym ROM is, is extremely useful. So everybody can memorize the capital of Italy, Rome, in English is R-O-M-E. And everybody can memorize that we have two types of problems in acid-base balance, respiratory and metabolic. And respiratory is written with R and metabolic is written with M. 
So it is something very simple. ROM and the R of ROM is respiratory, respiratory problems, and the M metabolic problems. And this is something very easy to memorize. The O and E are a little more difficult to understand and relate with opposite, the word opposite or the word equal. And it refers to the behavior of the pH or the CO2. Only pH and CO2 don't include bicarbonate in this trick, in this trick that we use to solve simple acid-base balance problems, which is where it found in questions in English. We need to ignore the bicarbonate, at least for a brief moment. Only we evaluate pH and pCO2, CO2 and pH. So you know that the pH should be 7.35 to 7.45. Anything, any pH that is below, below 7.35 in this range, below, below 7.35, it is acidosis, it's acid. Any pH that is above 7.45, so any pH that is in this range is alkalosis. So what is the first that we need to see in an acid-based problem? Problem. The first is to see the pH. If the pH is below the normal, it's an acidosis. If it is above the normal, it's an alkalosis. So you have 50% of the problem solved just looking to the pH, looking to the pH. But then you are going systematically and with discipline, you are going to draw arrows, arrows at the side of the pH and the CO2, ignoring the bicarbonate. You, do, you ignore the bicarbonate. And for example, in this example, in this example, I'm going to draw an arrow going down because the pH is going down, is low. And because here the CO2 is low, because the, the lower level is 35, then I also draw an arrow in the same direction going down. So I observe the two, the two arrows and I say, are they equal, you know, equal, or are they opposite? And they say, no, they are equal. So you find the letter associated with equal. Which letter is associated with equal? M. And M represents metabolic. We already said we knew that it was an acidosis because the pH was low. So it is an acidosis. Which type of acidosis? Metabolic or respiratory? Metabolic. It is a metabolic acidosis. If, for example, with the same pH that is acid, it is also an acidosis, but we see that the CO2 is high, we are going to draw an arrow downward for the pH, but upward for the CO2. Why, why upward for the CO2? Because it's high, it's a high CO2. But now we analyze the directions of those arrows are equal or opposite, are opposite. Obviously they are opposite. Okay, they are going to have a frontal crash if they continue. So we go to the letter O, O of opposites. And which other letter is associated with this O is the R. R of what? Of respiratory. So this acidosis is respiratory. So this trick for any person having problems with acid-base balance interpretation is enough. Summarizing for anchor's test, for anchor's test, you know, for anchor's test, uh, for the identification of it. So summarizing, what you do first, check the pH and decide if it is acidosis or alkalosis or if, if, or, or if it is normal. Then go to the comparison of the pH and the CO2 drawing arrows at the side. And observe if the arrows are in the equal direction or same direction or in opposite uh, or contrary direction. And use this um, mnemonic to know when it is a, a metabolic or respiratory problem. If the arrows are opposite, the problem is respiratory. If the arrows are equal, the problem is metabolic. And using this trick is more than enough 
to solve or to diagnose most of the um, acid base disbalance problem that you will find in ANCUS. This is not the most difficult part of ANCUS question. The difficult part of ANCUS question is here. ANCUS will test you which acid base balances are expected in common uh, clinical situations. So they want you to know, for example, that in diabetic ketoacidosis, excuse me, diabetic ketoacidosis, in renal failure, in lactic acidosis, and in diarrhea, you have metabolic acidosis. So this requires first understanding and second memorization. Why in diabetic ketoacidosis we have acidosis? Because we have the production of an abnormal acid called keto acid. So keto, ketone bodies are keto acids, okay? Keto acids, okay? This is going to be found only in type one, type one diabetes mellitus, in which because the absolute and total absence of insulin, the glucose cannot enter inside the cell to be burned by the mitochondria to produce ATP, and instead the client needs to burn in the mitochondria fat. When you burn fat, you are thin and you produce as a byproduct keto acid, and this keto acid makes the blood acid. For that reason, the pH will be low, yes, and the CO2 will be low because metabolic is equal when we compare that. Why the CO2 is low if CO2 is a problem of the lung? To compensate. People don't like dying. It's logical. It, is, it has a logic that falls in front of you. People don't like to die. So when a person has a metabolic acidosis, like for example, a patient with this excess of keto acid, later, after initiating the acidosis, the metabolic acidosis, they notice that they are dying and they do something to survive, to stay alive. And what they do, they try to eliminate the only acid that can be eliminated of the body quickly, and is the CO2. I repeat, the patient with diabetic ketoacidosis has no problem at all with the lungs, has a perfect lung, any respiratory problem. But because the metabolism produces this abnormal acid that cannot be eliminated quickly, then the person starts blowing fast and deep to eliminate the acid that can yes be eliminated and is the CO2. We already said that CO2 is acid as the lemon and the vinegar, yes? So the person will start hyperventilating after and después, after the patient develops the metabolic acidosis will start hyperventilating secondarily as a compensation. And for that reason, will hyperventilate to eliminate CO2 and trying to eliminate some acid of the too much acid that is having in the body to stay alive. Do you understand? So this hyperventilation is a compensation of a problem that was present before. And this problem that was present before the ketoacidosis is a metabolic acidosis. Why the patient is having now hyperventilation? To compensate. It is secondary. Yes. So this secondary hyperventilation to eliminate CO2 is called Kushmaul respiration. So remember, when you have metabolic acidosis, Kushmaul respiration. So you can, if it's McDonald, Mac, Mac Kushmaul could be a way of memorizing that. Okay. So uh, this is a classical example 
of metabolic acidosis, the diabetic ketoacidosis. You need to uh, understand why in renal failure, where the patient has not kidneys in end stage renal failure, the patient has metabolic acidosis. Didn't we say that the bicarbonate is produced by the kidneys? So if the kidneys cannot produce bicarbonate, who is going to win? The acid, because remember, they need to be in balance, in equilibrium. Ah, now you don't have bicarbonate. Who wins? Acid. So because the failure in the production of bicarbonate in renal failure, the patient develop metabolic acidosis. So how you expect to see a patient in end stage renal disease in hospice refusing dialysis you expect to see the client hyperventilating because it's algo is 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 a compensation that is a reflex so the patient will try to eliminate the acid of the body hyperventilating so this kushmaul respiration also is seen in patients with end stage renal failure that are not in dialysis lactic acidosis lactic acid is something that the cell produces when there is no oxygen to burn the glucose we already know that inside the cell enters the glucose under the action of the insulin is uptaken by the mitochondria mitochondria breaks down the glucose producing atp atp plus water and co2 okay this breaking down need to occur in presence of oxygen because this metabolism is aerobic if there is not oxygen arriving to the cell for any reason and the most common is shock then the metabolism deviates from aerobic to anaerobic in absence of oxygen and apart of not producing too much atp this metabolism produces a venom, a toxic substance called lactic acid. So the patient will start accumulating, building up lactic acid and present a metabolic acidosis because lactic acid is acid. And diarrhea is a cause, severe diarrhea, of metabolic acidosis because in the intestine, in the intestinal juice, there is a huge abundance of bicarbonate. If the patient is having a severe diarrhea, then it's going to happen a loss of bicarbonate. If we lose the bicarbonate, again, no? If we lose the bicarbonate, if we don't have the bicarbonate, eliminate the bicarbonate, it's, it's in the toilet, it's, it's, it's gone by the diarrhea, okay? Who is going to win? The acid. That's why diarrhea produces acidosis, produces acidosis. Make sense? So if you understand the pathophysiology of one, each one of those diseases, then it's very easy to memorize which conditions produce metabolic acidosis and um, the compensation that you expect in those patients. The other condition to know is the respiratory acidosis. Also acidosis, but now the responsible is not the metabolism, is the lung, is the respiration. When for any reason the patient is hypoventilating, yes, breathing in and out less than normal, hypoventilating, we already discussed, yeah, is going to retain CO2. And because the CO2 retained is acid, the patient becomes acid and it is an acidosis, but because the problem is in the, in the lung, it's called respiratory acidosis. So now the pH will be low, but the CO2 will be high. The arrows go in opposite direction and using ROM, it is a respiratory acidosis. Make sense? Very well. When we hypoventilate, when there is problem in the respiratory center, when there is problem in the nerves and the muscles, when there is problem in the airway mainly. So, for example, what we have in COPD, 
in COPD, we have a problem in the airways. The bronchi okay, are obstructed. This is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And because the smoking, etc., the bronchi are obstructed, obstructed with vasoconstriction, obstructed with edema and inflammation, and obstructed by phlegms, secretions. So the patient has problem to move the air in and out, and because it has problem moving the air in and out, has hypoventilation. COPD produces hypoventilation because obstruction of the airway. But it is a chronic condition. There are acute obstructions of the airway, like a foreign body in the trachea, you know, a piece of beef, something like this, or, or, or toy or something, like, I don't know, laryngospasm, like a, a anaphylaxis and angioedema and edema of the glottis. Um, um, we can have a weakness of the muscle, like in acute Guillain-Barré, and acute, no, and in Guillain-Barré or myasthenia crisis, uh, gravis in crisis, or we have uh, a depression of the respiratory center because it's overdose, overdose of morphine, opioids, or magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's easy to understand that if in any of these conditions, the patient is not breathing, as much as necessary, then the patient is hypoventilating, is retaining CO2, and has a respiratory acidosis. Okay. Sadly, 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 in the acute respiratory acidosis, I mean an overdose of opioids, an obstruction of the airway, a Guillain Barre machine crisis, um, uh, the body cannot compensate like in the metabolic acidosis. There is no way of compensating here. Yeah. And the life of the client will depend, will depend on the nurse and the doctor. That's why those situations, okay, those situations of acute respiratory acidosis, overdose of opioids, brain edema, airway obstruction, or angioedema, anaphylaxis, uh, foreign bodies, Guillain Barre crisis, myasthenia crisis, okay, uh, are priorities. In question of prioritization, those are the priorities because there is no way of compensation. The chronic obstruction of the COPD has some level of compensation, and for that reason, patients with COPD generally are not in the prioritization question the first to see. Because they compensate because it's a very chronic condition. The body gets used to the, the high level of CO2. It, it, it gets used to the low level of oxygen. And for that reason, a patient with COPD has high hemoglobin and high count of red blood cells. That's why a patient with COPD has high level of bicarbonate to neutralize the excess of the acid CO2 because has, the kidneys have enough time to compensate producing more bicarbonate. Uh, so summarizing, in Anchor's question, when you have a chronic respiratory acidosis, I say it, it means COPD is not a priority, generally. Not always, but it's generally not a priority. But if you have an acute, these examples, respiratory acidosis, those are priority. Okay. The metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis in English practically is a, is a resume, is limited to the patient that has nasogastric suction. Uh, you know, when there is intestinal obstruction, when there is surgery, when there is several situations, uh, doctors can order a nasogastric to connect it to a potent machine that is intermittently uh, suctioning the content of the stomach. And you know that is uh, the content of our stomach, our gastric juices are acid, very acid. So naturally, we have acid in the stomach. And when this machine is continuously sucking this acid, then if you lose the acid, if the acid is the one that is lost now, uh, the acid is gone, who is going to win? The bicarbonate, the alkalosis, yes? So nasogastric suction is the classical example 
of the um, metabolic alkalosis. Of course, the other um, option could be vomit, but need to be too much vomit. In this case, the, the situation could be, for example, hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a condition in pregnancy where the, the woman is vomiting too much, or the babies that are born with pyloric stenosis, a narrowing of the pylorus valve that makes the baby vomit, vomit, vomit continuously and projectile vomits. Could be examples of situations that you can have, okay, because loss of gastric content with vomit, okay, metabolic alkalosis. A rare but possible cause of alkalosis is a person that for psychiatric reason is consuming too much antacid or bicarbonate. This is something called baking soda, which is by sodium bicarbonate and antacid, my lanta, my may logs, thumbs. There are people that are obsessive compulsive and start consuming too much of the stuff. And this is, could be a cause of this. People that have heartburn because are you know, having a hiatal hernia and a lot of gastroesophageal reflux disease, they can, for that reason, start consuming a lot of uh, antacid. And then they used to consume a lot of milk. In the moment, milk will uh, relieve the heartburn, but then later, the rebound stimulation of the milk will produce um, a more heartburn. And then consume antacid, and then they have this combination of milk and antacids that is a vicious cycle that produce excess of consume. But those are rare cases. And the last but not the least, because it's super frequent in English, is the respiratory alkalosis. Is when a person is hyperventilating. When a person can, can hyperventilate, when have normal respiratory center, when has normal airway, when has normal muscles and nerves, and for any reason decide to hyperventilate. The most common and famous cause is anxiety. Anxiety may, makes us hyperventilate. And there is an extreme situation of anxiety that is the panic attack. So patients that are in panic attack, hyperventilate, then you need to make them, okay, uh, return the CO2, making them breathe in cup hands or using a rebreather mask with bag to rebreathe back the CO2. Don't use the paper bag because it's, it's, it's a profiling, it's a translate, uh, you know, something like a ridicule. Um, it's not the best option in English. And the other reason to hyperventilate is a little more complex to explain. If when the patient has low oxygen, Okay, when you have low oxygen, because other problems, a uh, chunk situation that is very difficult to explain in nursing, which, for example, uh, the best example is pulmonary embolism. Um, patients that have hypoxia because of um, alveolar problems. Let's see, um, let's talk about, for example, pulmonary edema, okay, or pneumonia. In those cases, the problem is the oxygenation, the gas exchange in the alveoli, not the airway. The airway is okay, but the problem is in the alveoli. And then when the, in the alveoli, there is problem because there is liquid there, there is pus there, there is atelectasis there, there is pulmonary embolism there. Then the patient don't get oxygen from the air. And when you don't have oxygen, the brain becomes upset. And when the brain becomes upset, then orders hyperventilation. A person with pulmonary embolism has normal airway. A person with a pneumonia has normal airway. A person with, um, como se llama, with um, atelectasis, a pulmonary edema has normal airway and also has normal muscles, has no Guillain-Barré, and has normal respiratory center. So for that reason, a person that has alveolar problem, gas exchange problem, can hyperventilate, and that's why you are going to see hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis associated with, with pneumonia, associated with atelectasis, associated with pulmonary embolism, associated with pulmonary edema, because the patient, because the low oxygen can hyperventilate, and as a matter of fact, will hyperventilate, and this is going to produce over elimination of CO2 and respiratory alkalosis. But I think it's too deep for anchors. 
that the panic attack is like enough. Another type of client that can have a hyperventilation is on purpose. It's clients that are intubated and on purpose, the doctor set the machine to hyperventilate the client. It is frequently found, frequently seen in patients with severe brain edema. One of the most efficient and fast ways of decreasing intracranial pressure in brain edema, trauma, surgery, etc., brain hemorrhage, uh, is hyperventilating the client, hyperventilation. A nurse is caring for a client with a nasogastric tube that is attached to low suction. The nurse monitors the client, knowing that the client is at risk for which acid may disorder. What is the answer? Metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis. This is an endless type question of acid base balance. Do you know what acid base disbalance is expected in this or that situation? This is the way the anchors make the question. Could be a little more complex. A nurse reviews the blood gas result of a patient with COPD. The nurse, anal the nurse analyzes the results and determines that the client is experiencing respiratory acidosis because it's this expected in, in uh, COPD. Which of the following values is compatible or reflects respiratory acidosis. So you need to look for the low pH. Low pH is one and four, yes? Because this is normal and this is high. So you eliminate this and this. So now you need to decide of these two acidosis, which one is respiratory. So what do you expect if the arrow of the pH is low, is low? What do you expect to be the arrow of the CO2 in respiratory acidosis, ROM, ROM, respiratory, opposite. Opposite. So, opposite. opposite, no? So this arrow is up, this arrow is down. Which arrows are opposite? One. So the answer is one. The four is a metabolic acidosis. Understand? So it's useful because they test in NCLEX pure, simple, simple acid base disbalance. They don't take mixed acid base disbalances. A client has the following, so forget, forget, uh, you know, um, for English, going too deep in, it, there is compensation, there is no compensation, always there is compensation. Very rarely there is no compensation. Always the patient trying to lie, to, to, to survive. Look what they what they what they really can't ask you. Uh-huh. In metabolic acidosis, how compensates the client? It is a negative question. And you need to say compensate hyperventilating, eliminating the only acid that you can eliminate, the CO2. And this is called Kussmaul respiration. In in como se llama? In Respiratory acidosis. How compens chronic, chronic, COPD. How compensate the client? With the time, the kidneys will eliminate acid and produce more bicarbonate to neutralize the excess of CO2 that accumulates in the body. No? This, those are those are okay compensation questions that are have been in anchors. But this stuff that, that is, is a partially compensated, total compensated, forget it. Don't, 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 don't get confused with that. It is not necessary for anchor. What is necessary for anchor? First, know what is an acidosis, what is an alkalosis, how to determine it is metabolic or respiratory, and learning this. This is what you need to learn for anchors. The conditions. Uh, that are as, uh, uh, or the acid base balances that are expected in common conditions that I went over with you minutes ago. A client has the following ABG. So the pH is low. I ignore the bicarbonate and the CO2 is high. Okay. So this patient has an acidosis and it's a respiratory acidosis because the, the arrows are opposite. No. Okay, the nurses correlate and the oxygen is very low. So always you, always you need to add 
And then you need to know that the normal value of oxygen is above of 80, no? so it's very low. The next correlate these values, this respiratory acidosis with low oxygen, with we situation, and you say, B, I agree with you. I agree with you. Because diabetic ketoacidosis is producing a metabolic acidosis. And here I have a respiratory acidosis. So I eliminate this option. I repeat, I learn. And I'll, unless I have Alzheimer's, advanced Alzheimer's, I learned, and a few minutes ago we discussed that in diabetic ketoacidosis, we have metabolic acidosis. And we determine here, because what we did, that, that this is a respiratory acidosis. So we rule out that. Anxiety induced hyperventilation in adolescence. We know that this produces alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis. And we are talking about a respiratory acidosis. So alkalosis cannot be ruled out that. Diarrhea. Diarrhea can produce loss of bicarbonate. So the patient develops acidosis, but metabolic acidosis. And we are talking about a respiratory acidosis. So what happens to a person that suddenly has obstruction of the airway? This person cannot ventilate. What is the consequence that the air cannot enter nor leave? Neither enter nor leave. Huh? So the patient cannot get oxygen, but cannot eliminate CO2. So what happens with the CO2 builds up? And what happens when the CO2 builds up makes acid the body because the CO2 is acid. That's why we have an acidosis and it's respiratory and the CO2 is and the, and the CO2 is high. And the oxygen is low because there is an obstruction of the airway. So this is the way that you apply to the scenario. Okay, acid base balances. A post-op client receives six units of packed red blood cells for intraoperative important massive blood loss. What you need to know that uh, happens in massive transfusion, but not in calcium. We, know, we already learned that it can produce hypocalcemia, but what can do? Massive transfusion in acid base balance. Who knows? Okay, the anticoagulant that the citrate, it, huh? the, the uh, citrate. Yes. It's a the metabolic anti alkalosis. Yes, exactly. Metabolic alkalosis. The anticoagulant, okay, that is used in um, in bank blood, which is citrate, okay, is an alkaline substance. Yeah, it's an alkaline substance. So in this bag, you have an anticoagulant inside together with the blood that is alkaline. If you receive many bags, many bags, you are receiving a dose, an important dose of an alkaline substance. So metabolic alkalosis is found in massive transfusion. So what we learn about transfusion, just in case we have questions about this, because this is classical, it's a classical question in nursing, that massive transfusion can produce several problems. Oh, sorry. Several problems, okay? And one problem is that this blood has no calcium, so can produce hypocalcemia. Two, this blood is alkaline, so can produce, can produce um, metabolic alkalosis. Maybe you should know the other problem. This blood is not totally fresh, has been there for one week, etc. So has many red blood cells that are old. For that reason, when those red blood cells are transferred to the person, probably when they go through the spleen, which is the place that destroy the old. That's why I never go to a spleen. Okay, uh, a spleen destroy destroy all 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 cells and all people. Okay, <laughs> so uh, when the old reproduces go through the spleen, the spleen destroy many of those cells. And remember that inside the reproduce cells you have potassium. So the transfusion, the massive transfusion of bank blood could produce an elevation of the potassium that in a normal kidney person is no big deal. But in a person that maybe maybe this person has also 
renal disease could be an issue. Those are the three complications that can be seen in, in transfusion. Let's see this. A client is in the emergency department after an overdose of an unknown substance. Swallow something unknown. Which assessment finding does the nurse correlate with possible salicylate poisoning? You need to know a little about aspirin intoxication, salicylate. Aspirin or salicylate is a acetyl salicylic acid. Acid. The last A is acid. So the salicylate are acid. And a part of that, the salicylate stimulate directly, directly the respiratory center. So this respiratory center we have in the brain that control the frequency of the respiration is directly stimulated by the aspirin. And aspirin is acid. When a person has an, too much aspirin, intoxication with salicylate will hyperventilate. It's a presentation of the salicylate intoxication. Why is hyperventilating? For two reasons. First is acid and develops Kussmaul respiration, which is a hyperventilation to compensate, but also has a direct stimulation of the respiratory center. So even will overcompensate. So what you expect in a patient intoxicated with aspirin is increase of the rate and depth of the respiration, yes? Because the two reasons that I explained. Is clear? Everybody understood that? So understand the um, acid-base disbalance and the effect of aspirin in the uh, hyperventilation observed in salicylate poisoning. So it is a late manifestation. It is a late manifestation of salicylate intoxication. Everybody know that the early is tinnitus, but it is a late manifestation of salicylate um, intoxication. For clients with acute ABG problems, which you see first? Who answered this question? She. Exactly. The patient with respiratory acidosis. Because it's, it's somebody that is or having a problem in the respiratory center or is having a problem in the airway or is having a problem in the muscles that make you breathe. Which acid-based disbalance you expect in a patient with um, Guillain-Barre Guillain -Barre in crisis, severe Guillain-Barre? Respiratory acidosis. 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 This is very frequent in ENCLE. Straightforward, not tricky. Here, the only difficult is nursing. That There is a lot. But the ENCLE has a straightforward question. But the problem is that they apply the knowledge to situations, real life situation, and you need to to make the the, the translation to that. Okay, so I wanted I I feel I felt uh, motivated to talk a little about this with you because I know is uh, don't say is very frequent and um I just wanted to talk a little about this um, uh, with you today. Let's see this for for a uh, quarter of hour that we have left to see some questions that that could also discuss. I moved this so much. I was this prepared to present and and I moved that. Just a moment, guys. Give me a second. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, what's this? Okay. Those are examples of questions that have been reproducing because are more or less similar to question that topics that are being English. If you have a patient that is going to have a mammogram that you know is the screening test for breast cancer, the most common cancer in women, and should be done yearly, starting in your 40s, no? If the woman is going to a mammogram, it is supposed that the nurse give instruction to the woman to have a without inconvenient test practice. What you should um, recommend or ask the client to be sure that the mammogram will be done without inconvenience. Let's go. No, not one to use the DRM. The last menstruation. Say again. 
Not to use the deodorant. The last menstruation. B and C. Okay. C. Okay, so let's go in with this, okay? So, did you take a bath today and antimicrobial soap? Is it pertinent? No. 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 When, is, no. when is this pertinent? When you're going to have surgery. When you are going to have surgery. Or a biopsy. You need or to maybe, ask the, la the or last. Or maybe, thing. yes, or maybe a biopsy. Yes, okay. So, surgery or biopsies. Yes, just in case. Just in case. Okay. Uh, okay, so we rule out this. And I'm, I'm, I'm dealing here with my markers. And okay, this is no. Okay. Did you put the other one today? Yes or not? Yeah, that's important. Yes. It is important because the deodorant in the armpit interferes with interfere the with the X ray. Okay. Is radio opaque and will interfere giving fake images in one of the most important in which in which quadrant of the breast is more common cancer? In the axillary. Yes, in the superior mm -hmm. and lateral, superior and external quadrant. The one that enters in the armpit, okay, that uh, the tail, the, the, and it is going to be interfered by the deodorant. So yes, I mark B. When was your last menstrual period? Yes or not? Yes. Because the woman yes. is pregnant. Yes. It is pregnant. This is pregnant. Should not receive a wall of. It need to be done. Need to protect the abdomen with a lead apron. Are you allergic to iodine? Yes or not? No, no, that's not no, no, because for, you don't need contrast for that. In, 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 which, in which radiological test we use iodine? In MRI with contrast? Uh, no, no. no. Oh, good. I, 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 I did something to do this. MRI doesn't use iodine. No, and, no, and no, the CT. The CT. And 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 Guys, remember that it's good to commit mistake here with me. If you correct a mistake here with me, I can correct the mistake. Yes. So it's good to co commit mistakes talking with me. The moment in which you should not commit mistakes in English. So what is better to commit the mistake with me? I correct the mistake and then you s I save your question in English. OK, so don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, saying a disparate, saying something wrong, okay? Because this, this is this is the the moment of correcting misconceptions. So don't forget. And I'm, and by the way, I'm pretty sure there are many people that thought that MRI is iodine, and thanks to your to your intervention, they are correcting their misconception. Okay, MRI doesn't use iodine contrast. Okay, it's a common question. It's a common question. But uh, somebody said CT scan, and it's true. The CT scan, CT is computer. The best scan too. Say again. The, the best can to use the no the best can use no? uh, another another misconception thank you uh, okay I'm going to talk about the pet scan now CT scan yes ayuda okay the, all the angiographies renal angiography uh, cerebral angiography no. coronal angiography that require catheterism angiography okay uh, a, they use iodine. So and those. Uh, Sorry, and the cardiac head? Endocrinal test. No, uh, cardiac attestations. Yes. Yes. Angiography is when you enter inside an artery and then you inject iodine in this artery. And you see the artery and how the artery branches and if there is any obstruction. You need, um, you can see classically the renal arteries are called renal angiography. You can see, you can see the mesenteric arteries. You can see the coronary arteries or you can see the cerebral arteries also in tumors, etc. So there are many options. So knowing the anatomy, the patient has, has two femoral arteries, two iliac arteries that join to the aorta, 
the aorta goes up and give the renal arteries and then make an arc and go to the heart, no, to the heart, okay, to the heart. But also has two branches that go to the brain, the carotid. So when a doctor enters in the femoral artery through a puncture in the femoral artery, can go up and will decide if you go to the renal or continue in the arc to the coronaries that are here or continue to the cerebral, okay? Or go to the mesenteric or go to the celiac, okay? Trunk, et cetera, et cetera. Do you understand? Those are called angiography. What they have in common, they have a puncture that the classical is in the groin. Could be in other part, could be in, 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 in the arm or other parts, but the classical is in the groin. It brings a local problem, a problem of potential bleeding because the patient could bleed here, okay, later when the patient finishes the procedure or could produce an obstruction by clot of this femoral artery producing ischemia of the leg. That's why you need to be checking the distal pulses in any angiography that uses cerebral, cardiac, renal, that uses the femoral artery. So here in the growing, in the femoral area, you have two problems to monitor after the procedure and is tested. And is the obstruction with a clot or the bleeding. Remember that the client need to be left resting, resting with the leg straight for several hours until the puncture heals or, or uh, closes very suddenly and there is no risk for bleeding. But meanwhile, you are checking the distal pulses comparatively to see if in the side of the puncture there is any obstruction or problem. It is a classical, it is basic nursing. And remember, we pass the ankle with basic question, not with the stratospheric or NASA question. Okay, the contra pelusa, la pelusa. No, 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 no. Basic question is what make your pass or fail anchors, okay? But also when they enter in the artery, they inject iodine and the iodine, okay, shows the shape of the arteries and the organs. This is called angiography. This angiography requires a catheter. That's why are also called catheterism. And this angiography, this angiography, it, allows in the case of the heart to ma no, also in the brain to manipulate the artery so if the artery has a clot they can suck remove this clot if the artery has a plaque of fat they can they can flatten this plaque of fat and leave a mesh there open that is called stent see so this is coronario Angiography, this is um, a angioplasty, coronary angioplasty, and stenting. So notice that all this terminology ends in the same angiography and has in common also the use of iodine. To use iodine, you need to know, because it's basic and tested, that the patient needs to be asked for iodine allergy, not for shellfish allergy. You need to ask for iodine allergy. Eliminate for anchors this story of the shellfish uh, uh, allergy. Second, you need to be sure that the client has normal kickness because iodine is contraindicated in renal failure. So anticipate that the creatinine is needed before the procedure and the client needs to be well, very well hydrated to avoid nephrotoxicity. All this has been tested. And third, but not last, remember that there is a medication, a medication called metformin, metformin that has interaction with the iodine, with the iodine, yes? and uh, the metformin should be discontinued before the procedure and cannot be reinitiated, cannot be restarted until um, two days after the procedure. Now NCLEX is uh, having a, let's see, tricky, 
este, a tricky question related with metformin. Sorry for that. Um, a tricky question with uh, metformin. ¿Por qué esto no me funciona? Just a second, guys. Yeah. Uh, in which they don't say metformin. They don't say metformin. They mention the family of medication to whom belongs the metformin. That is B1 eyed. Please learn this this term, if you don't remember from pharmacology, you should study that in pharmacology that the most important oral hypoglycemic medication are the B1 night prototype metforming, sulfonylureas prototype uh, glipicide, the um, the bioglitazone, que es um, la, la familia, and las inc incretins. Because the liraglutide, uh, uh, liraglutide, um, um, exenatide, etc. So B1 night, B1 night, so B1 night, uh, sorry, okay, B1 night, okay, B1 night, okay, B1 night. Please learn this name. This name is the same as this. Are we okay? Are we okay? Are you learning that? Okay. PET scan. PET scan. Positron emission tomography. Question English. Which element is used to do a PET scan? Iodine, gadolinium, which is the gadolinium is the one that is used in MRI. Okay. Uh, or glucose. Glucose. And the answer is glucose. So the contrast that they use in, in PET scan is radioactively labeled glucose. It's a very mild radioactivity, no big deal, but the client is injected in the vein glucose, radioactive glucose, and needs to wait a time, a time frame, giving time for the cells of the body to uptake the glucose into the mitochondria to metabolize the glucose into ATP. This is something that we have been repeating today. But what happens? The cells that have more metabolism, that need more ATP, more energy, are going to uptake more radioactive glucose than the cells that are not have, that are normal and are not having this exaggerated metabolism the cells that normally have exaggerated metabolism are cancer cells and inflammatory cells so pet scan is very useful to detect very teeny very small cancers that cannot be seen with ct scan and mri or areas of inflammation that are difficult to see in other procedures. That's why PET scan is, uh, is, is, is that, that's for what PET scan is used, to diagnose very teeny, teeny, teeny problems. And of course, it's also used to see how active, if active is an organ. For example, for the research of how brain works, is very useful, a PET scan. Because if you are using one part of the brain, because you are doing, for example, calculation, you are using your frontal lobe, you see how the frontal lobe uptakes more glucose because it's working more than the rest of the brain. But for example, if you are hearing music, you see how the temporal lobe is the one that is having more uptake of glucose. So those are the use. So I explain that not because it's going to be in English. The question in the English is only one. What? What? contrast you expect to be used in a PET scan and you need to know glucose. It's not contraindicated in diabetic clients because the amount of glucose is not. Um, this, um, this test has only one contraindication. Which client, which person do you think should not have a PET scan? Who can imagine that? Pregnancy. Pre pregnancy. pregnancy, because you cannot inject a radioactive substance to a pregnant woman because can damage the feet. There is a test in, in cardiology called the MUGA scan, the MUGA scan, 
multi gated uptake gain acquisition. More I can, you don't need to know, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I'm just boasting, okay, that I remember what it means, but you need to know what is MUGA scan. Is a scan frequently, frequently, frequently done in modern cardiology and uses radioactivity, radioactivity, okay, the isotopes are very mild radioactivity, so there is no risk. But always, always are contraindicated in pregnant women, yeah? And for that reason, for that, both for iodine or for radioactive substances, once the test is done, you don't want this substance staying in the body. You want, you want the substance being flush from the body. So always expect that it's going to be ordered, okay, over hydration of the client but, uh, to eliminate uh, this stuff, okay? So why I talk about this? Because I've been in anchors and I talk about what I see in anchors because this is what I do. And I don't know if it's going to be in your test or not, because but anything can be in your, in your test, okay? In which situation a nurse should put on hold? You know that we nurses can withhold. We don't discontinue, we withhold. So it's a patient that is going to receive digoxin, has a heart rate of 59, we don't give the tablet. We withhold the tablet and call the doctor. We always withhold and call the doctor. The doctor is going to decide if it is necessity of this continuation or can be modified. Okay, the situation. In which situation the nurse should put on hold the lithium administration in a patient with bipolar disorder? Headache, this is the hiccup diarrhea. diarrhea. Taking diarrhea. diarrhea. Why diarrhea? Why because diarrhea? Hyponatremia. Because of hyponatremia. Yes, because hypo of hyponatremia. Because hyponatremia. Because to hyponatremia, yes, because sodium is lost also in the diarrhea and dehydration. Both hydration and sodium influence in the elimination of the lithium, which is a very toxic substance. It was exactly like this a question in anchor. Claro, not exactly like this because you know the wording was different, but the options were this. Okay, the student remember the options. Okay, so why what you learn from this that lithium is very toxic, and any question about lithium probably will be related with toxicity, and one cause of the lithium toxicity is when there is low sodium in the body or low water, low liquid in the body. These two conditions produce lithium intoxication if the client is taking uh, lithium. So this is a reason to withhold the dose and, and um, contact the physician. Remember that an earliest manifestation of lithium toxicity is a gross, gross tremor. A fine tremor, a fine tremor is expected, is expected taking lithium. A fine tremor in the tip of the fingers, but a gross tremor that prevents you from drinking water, for example, is a manifestation, is an early manifestation of lithium toxicity is another common question in NCLEX. Okay. The bipolar client has been prescribed lithium carbonate 300 milligrams BID. Which of the following findings in the client record records required to clarify the order with the provider? Blood glucose high, sodium high, creatinine 1.8, allergy to sulfates. I agree yes. with you. I agree with you because it is the third element that I needed to comment of lithium toxicity. Lithium is excreted through the kidneys. It's excreted to the kidneys if you have enough water and enough sodium in your blood because it's exchanged with sodium and you need the water to have diuresis. But if the kidneys are damaged, no matter that you have adequate amount of sodium of water, then the kidneys cannot eliminate the lithium. Lithium cannot be given in patients with renal disease. So what we learned of this, that lithium toxicity increases when the sodium is low, when there is dehydration, 
or when there is increment of the creatinine or renal failure. Those are the three factors that can produce lithium toxicity. I'm trying to apply that to a scenario. If you have a client with a diet low in sodium, a client taking diuretics, a client that is dehydrated, a client that has vomits and diarrhea, is a patient at risk of lithium toxicity. Group of diabetic medication put on hold 48 hours and 48 hours before and after CT scan with contrast. Uh, big one eyes. Big one eyes. Okay, big one eyes. A patient arrived to the ER with a long stick nailed, so it's impaled by a long stick in the chest. A comment, I had this experience in ER many, many years ago. A boy who was, uh, you know, climbing in a tree and he fell, and then one branch that was like this impelled the chest of the boy. The nurse hears a sucking sound. <laughs> Obviously, this sucking sound is each time the patient breathing. Huh? Action the nurse needs to do first. Remove the stick and tape three sides of non-porous dressing. Place the patient in Trendelenburg position and administer oxygen. Place a porous dressing and tape the four sides. Insert two large board IV catheters. So what do you think is the best option in this scenario? I think it's B. B. Can you please tell me, because it's difficult for me to differentiate, is B as in boy or D as in diamond? C. B. B. B as in boy. B. B as in boy. Okay, B as in boy. Place the clients in Trendelenburg position and administer oxygen. What is the benefit of placing the clients in Trendelenburg position? Increase the perfusion to the brain. brain. Yes, but um, word where here says that the priority is, here um, I mean, is when the where, where here say that the priority here is uh, is 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 a patient that has pneumothorax. Is a patient that has a okay, respiratory problem. I think that the trend in the position doesn't favor the. Is A. Okay, but you know what is what disqualify A that you re, that you remove the stick. You know that when you have you have a wound that has a knife, has a say your scissors or whatever impelled, introduced there, if you remove that without being the client already in OR, ready to do the, the, the surgery, then the interior blood vessels start bleeding, 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 and then it's going to be a loss of time while the patient is moved for, to OR for surgery and the patient can die. So summarizing moral, don't remove any penetrating object in a wound unless is ordered by the doctor being the client already in OR. When you remove the stick, the stick is compressing the blood vessels, minimizing or, 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 or impeding the, the bleeding. When you remove the stick, the knife, the museum, lo que sea, then the blood vessel is going to be broken, but freely to bleed. And then the patient can die. So a moral. It will because, be D done for okay, D. Okay, okay, okay. Now, now, now we are not we are not guessing which one is. Okay. Now we are discussing what is the best, and then we are clear that we need to learn that this is unacceptable. So this allowed totally rule out this option. Yes. Uh, we were we were trying to to determine if Trendelenburg was beneficial in this client. OK, because we need to know that Trendelenburg is a position that is not recommended in modern um, nursing because Trendelenburg difficults a lot the respiration of the client because Trendelenburg pushes the diaphragm up and Trendelenburg uh, favors in patients that are unconscious uh, to have the gastric content draining through the esophagus to the air weight and promoting aspiration. Um, what we recommend 
now is to place what is called modified Trendelenburg, no? which is only elevation of the lower extremities. No? So there is elevation of the lower extremities with something, but the patient is not placed in Trendelenburg. So uh, it is possible. It is an attractive option, but I put that in interrogation. OK, what happens if you have a client with a sucking wound in the chest and you uh, um, place a tape in the foresight? What can happen? Tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. That is the reason. That's the reason for which should be taped only three sides. If you tape only three sides, then you allow the air to leave in the side that has not been taped. OK, so if you have a dressing here, when the patient breathing and the dressing is non porous, when the patient breathing, the, the wound sucks the dressing in the hole and air doesn't enter. But when the patient breathe out, the air that is in the plural space can live, can live from here. So you see, I don't know if you're seeing me uh, very well, but it's something like when, when you breathe in, so when you breathe out, you understand? So it's going to work like a valve that allows the air to lift, but not to enter. And this prevents the tension in the motoras. That's why the student was um, attracted to this option, but then the, the trick, the, yes, the, the, the difficult part is that was removing the stick, and this cannot be done. So this disqualifies this option. But this part of the taping the four pines produce tension pneumothorax, which is the complication of the pneumothorax. So obviously need to be le left between B and D. There is nothing wrong in this client to take two veins, okay, to, to initiate fluids. There is nothing wrong in giving oxygen. What uh, concerns me what concerns me is the trend that in bird position. Can the trend that in bird position favors this patient to breathe? And no. I'm concerned that not. So if I were in NCLEX with the deciding in these two options, I would prefer, I'm not completely sure, but I prefer D because there is nothing to question to auction D as in diamond. But auction B as in boy, has the the objection that this patient is not being favored with the Trendelenburg position because the priority is the the impalement of the chest where is the lung and uh the patient need to be um uh, you know uh, facilitated the respiration the Trendelenburg position is is something against respiration. So this is just a question to make you understand that you are going to be in this dilemma in NCLEX very frequently because you know you are going to be between two options. And then um, you need to see which one has you know more probability to share the right answer. What do you think? What do you think about this discussion that I brought? So one thing that I uh, realized is yesterday we had uh, a session with our our integration professor and he we were talking about non-invasive versus invasive. So the reason why I didn't go with uh, the D um, and I did with B was because it was the least invasive. But looking at the question further, I see that it's from the emergency room. So maybe we want to get it fixed right away. So yes, you need to take with a grain of salt those dogmas. Because oh, no. we are we are we, we, we are supposed to get IVs independently in a person that is critically ill. It's, it's important that any client that is arriving in ER critically ill, we are supposed to automatically get the vein has a vein available. So it uh, is true that inserting catheters is an invasive procedure. At, at oxygen is less invasive, but. Um, uh, we need, we need, we need to insert those. Those sometimes we need to to be invasive. Okay. 
Yeah, this patient must go to OR to yeah. get the procedure. So, so it's yeah, a routine. It, we, we nurses get veins. We nurses get peripheral veins. Okay, we don't wait for the order. We get the peripheral veins because you know we know the patient quickly are going to collapse, enters in shock, and then it's going to be very difficult to get veins. So one of the first stuff that after we guarantee the the, the respiration, uh, is to get veins. Okay? It is um, um, an acceptable invasion okay, of the of the client. But also, if we're following the ABC, isn't airway breathing part of that as well? Is, I, I, is the answer D? I, I can stop talking now. <laughs> is the yes, answer but D? Remember that Trendelenburg is against breathing. Mm, okay. The problem with Trendelenburg is that impedes breathing. When you, when you elevate the head of the bed, you favor breathing. But when you place the client in Trendelenburg, the abdominal organs push the, 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 the diaphragm upward. You know, in, in, you know, uh, uh, obstructing the breathing, uh, impairing the breathing, and what say the books is that there is higher incidence of uh, aspiration of gastric content when the client is in Trendelenburg, you know, especially if the client is unconscious. Okay, and uh, so that's why I, I, I didn't like Trendelenburg, and that's why we don't use Trendelenburg uh, anymore in the majority of the cases. In very, very, very few occasions, okay, there is a, enough research that say that with elevation, with elevation of the legs is enough to obtain the benefit that was obtained before with the Trendelenburg position. That is displacing the blood circulation to the heart and to the rest of the body, including the brain. It's because in the legs, there is a lot of blood pooling. There is a lot of, of, of blood pooling here, and when 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 we elevate the, the legs, we, this blood is going to be transfused to the to the circulation, uh, the modified Trendelenburg, and that's it. Is and those are examples. The question that had been, uh, uh, and this is something that you need to understand when I discuss this question with you. I don't have a dogmatic answer key that say no. Has he say that it is the the right answer? It's a question to discuss. And what we could do when we have a situation similar like this in anchors, because you go to anchors, and this is the way that we need to to, to make work the 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 the, the mind. So just an example. So just an example, though. Okay. So let me do the last one. The neonatologist nurse is preparing a newborn for a heel puncture to obtain blood for testing. Which of the following intervention is correct? In preparing, in preparation for the puncture, allow the newborn sleep with the foot uncovered to make the puncture without awakening. Uh, apply lidocaine ointment, one percent to heal thirty minutes before puncture. Place a pacifier with sucrose, sucrose is sugar or something sweet, no, in the newborn mouth for sucking. Request administration of a local anesthetic uh, injected in by the provider. What do you think is the best option there? Could it be B? As in cat. I think it's B as in boy. Yeah, me too. OK. Yes, because they did that to my son. The, the light, OK? No, the glucose. Oh, uh, OK, OK. The pacifier. What is accepted? What is in the literature? What is in, in the book? What is in the, re, in the evidence based practice? in this moment is that a pacifier with something sweet decreases the pain in the infant and is the analgesia used for this uh, mildly to moderate painful procedure. The lidocaine, you can apply lidocaine in the skin, is not going to produce any kind of, of, of anesthesia. If you want anesthesia in the skin, you need to use cold, something very cold, okay? The very cold numbness produced is what you do before the puncture. Lidocaine penetrates and produces numbness in the mucosa, but not in the skin. The skin is, is, is need to be injected, need, is in, impervious to the, to the lidocaine. It's not going to produce numbness in the skin. Even the patches of lidocaine don't produce numbness in the skin. So learn that, learn that, that is what is done nowadays 
to decrease pain is the answer that need to be um, preferred because is what is in the, in the literature, even for circumcision. OK, even for circumcision. OK, OK. OK, guys, I'm sorry for the, um, ¿cómo se llama? For the inconvenience we have today. First time that it happened to me. I've been using Teams all the time. OK, I was just thinking in create a connection with Zoom because I use Zoom a lot in the, and they had problem with Zoom. But thanks God, um, you know, it, it was corrected. But I, I received a lot of notification that other people were having problem with things. It looks like something was working, but I hope that it doesn't happen again. Thank you for helping me to. To solve the problems and well, we'll see you um, next Monday. If you want to connect, okay. Thank you, Professor. 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 And see you. I hope that is is helpful. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.